Okay, guys, today we are going to talk about how to create reliability in your training. We are going to talk about reinforcement when it comes to dog training. A lot of people screw this up. A lot of people make mistakes here and they wonder why they don't have a reliable product or they don't have a dog that does things the way they want the dog to do things in the product of their obedience, of the dog's behavior, so on and so forth. What is reinforcement? Let's answer that question first. Reinforcement is the process by which you strengthen or create behavior patterns, all right? Especially when we're relating it to the discussion we're having now. A lot of people tend to view reinforcement as exclusively positive. When I say I train with reinforcement, a lot of people think I'm talking about positive reinforcement. There are two quadrants of reinforcement. There is positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Before I get into those things, let me talk to you guys quickly about something. Whenever I train a dog to do something, whether it's competition, whether it's tracking, whether it's obedience for the street, whether it's bite work, I am always training with both quadrants of reinforcement. And the reason why is this, I need the behavior to be reliable. Look, in this age of social media, there's a lot of guys that are making like really fancy videos. And listen, I'm guilty of it too. I'll make like a fancy healing video and all that type of stuff, right? And they'll make a, a video where they're luring a puppy or they're baiting a dog with a toy or they're doing something with it's just like there's no equipment on the dog. It's all just positive, positive, positive. And people look at that and it's a nice picture. The dog's flashy. Everything looks cool. People look at that and say, I want that. And I understand why they say I want that. I'm going to do that. I understand why they say I'm going to do that. But here's the thing. They're not showing you the whole picture and they're not showing you something that's going to actually lead to reliability. Again, whether I'm training for the trial field, the street, for anything, I'm always looking at reliability. That's why when you see me teaching something as simple as a sit, you'll see me reward the dog and you'll see me also put pressure on the dog. So let's get into positive and negative reinforcement so you guys can maybe understand this process a little more. Positive reinforcement, giving the dog something good for doing something good. If I want him to sit and I pull up with a hot dog, I have a hot dog in my hand and I just pull up with the hot dog, he sees the hot dog go up, he naturally puts his rear end down and I put the hot dog in his mouth. This is an example of positive reinforcement that you all should be able to understand. Negative reinforcement. This is making a mildly aversive stimuli in order to strengthen or create a behavior. And by mildly aversive, I mean mildly aversive. A lot of people view negative reinforcement, they think that's punishment. There's a lot of really bad terminology being spread around. Those are punishment-based trainers or whatever else. What they really mean is those trainers use negative reinforcement or maybe they use a lot of negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is as I described, it's still the process by which you teach the dog to do something. Punishment, just to be clear, is the process by which you eliminate a behavior. The application of an aversive consequence to a specific behavioral contingency that creates a reduction in that behavior or ultimately an extinction in that behavior. That's the scientific definition of it. You can't be a punishment-based trainer, it's impossible because you would never train the dog to do anything. You would just be able to train the dog to not do things. If you're training the dog to do any kind of obedience, any kind of behavior that the dog isn't already doing, you are using some form of reinforcement. A lot of people say, well, I want to be, I want to use positive reinforcement. If I have to pick between the two, I'm going to use the positive. I'm going to give my dog things. I'm going to give him hot dogs. I'm going to give him tugs, whatever else. I don't want to put pressure on him. As nice as that sounds and as good as that feels, that is not realistic. And the reason why it's not realistic, I'm going to give you a very short answer to this. Competing motivators. The world is full of competing motivators. The trainers that like to stay exclusively here will all tell you about the benefits of training exclusively with positive reinforcement. It's so good that dogs have an emotional response. This scientific study, that scientific study. What they don't tell you is, if you watch them all train their dogs, they all use leashes. Why don't they give their dog free will? Why don't they walk around outside with no leash on their dog, around squirrels, bunnies, other dogs, people, traffic, all these things. Why don't they give their dog free will? The reason they don't give their dog free will is because they know their dog will not always choose the positive reinforcement that they have. The reality is the world is full of positive reinforcement. We don't have a monopoly on positive reinforcement. Look, when I'm talking here about the positive and negative quadrants of reinforcement, I'm basically talking about operant conditioning. The limitation of operant conditioning is that it kind of views behavior as existing in a sterile environment. Your dog does not exist in a sterile environment, whether he's in this room, outside, on the street in front of your house, wherever he happens to be on the trial field, there is constantly things that compete for his motivation. 
whether it's you with your liver treats or your ball or the other dog that smells very interesting or the bunny running across the road. All of these things are competition. And the idea that your dog will only ever pick you if given complete free will, no leash, is asinine. Your kids won't even always pick you, all right? Your two-year-old child will not pick you all the time. We all know that. This is why there must be the positive and the negative. Because when you layer both of these things into the learning process, now you're really on the rocket fuel. Let me give you an example now of that same sit I just talked about. Let's say, instead of just luring him with the hot dog to sit, I pulled up on the collar with the leash, and he put his rear end on the ground. I stopped pulling, and I gave him the hot dog. Now I'm accessing both of these quadrants in the training. The negative to the positive. Now he's like, okay, it was mildly uncomfortable. I did something. The discomfort went away, and holy camoly bonus. I got something great. Using both of these things together, I am now creating reliability in my training. Everything I train, I don't think, how can I lure the dog into doing this? How can I manipulate the dog with positive reinforcement to do this? I don't do that. I think, how can I get him to do this and how can I make sure he always does this? Whether I'm training a sit, a down, a heel, whatever it is, tracking, as I've already talked about, Everything, you will see me layering the negative reinforcement into the behavior alongside the positive reinforcement. Making sure that the dog is in a state of drive, that he's enjoying what he's doing, that he wants to do it, but also teaching him that he should do it, that he must do it, and ultimately that he needs to do it. That's where you get that reliability across any sphere of work that you're doing with your dog. It turns out, in life, extremes aren't good. Being exclusively positive is not good and being exclusively negative because there are trainers that don't believe in positive reinforcement. I don't give my dog food. I don't give my dog toys. He just has to always do it. And you can create reliability doing this. This was, this was the old school way of training. We've trained like this for a very long period of time with the, just that negative reinforcement. It's not punishment-based training. It's negative reinforcement-based training. The application of negative reinforcement and the release of it is how they train the dogs. The problem is the dogs were reliable but they weren't happy. Who doesn't want their dog to be happy or as happy as possible in the training process? I want my kid to go to school. I want him to learn. He has to go to school. He has to learn for his own good, but I also want him to enjoy it. I don't want him to hate every moment of school. Does that make sense to you guys? Because it makes a hell of a lot of sense to me. It's the same with the dog. Obedience training, behavior training, all of these things, these aren't optional. I don't know why we treat dog training like it's some kind of like fun optional thing to do. I mean, it surely can be, but there are some fundamentals. You've got to come when I call you. You've got to stay when I tell you to stay. You've got to not go after that dog when I tell you to not go after that dog or go after that bunny. Like this is literally life and death. If you're being aggressive, you've got to not be aggressive anymore. This is life and death. We put down dogs. Dogs get killed in the street all the time because there is no have to in their lives. They've just allowed to run amok. Like you see these young kids, going back to human examples, all these like 17, 18 year old kids that didn't grow up, you know, with both parents in the home or they didn't grow up even with parents at all. Because they don't have that direction, because they don't have that love and that discipline and love and discipline are together, they run amok until finally they reach an age where they do something really egregious. They really hurt somebody. They even kill somebody. They do something horrific and they end up in jail for a long period of time and their lives are ruined. It's the same with dogs, except they don't go to jail. They get put down. They end up without a home. They end up in the shelter, so on and so forth. It is your responsibility as a dog owner, whatever it is that you're doing with your dog, whether you're modifying a dangerous behavior or training your dog life-saving obedience, or if you're in the game of doing dog sport or police work or whatever it is with your dog, to train your dog to be reliable in the behavior. And you will never get there from exclusively positive or exclusively negative. The best is using both. Now, of course, some dogs require a lot more of one than the other. Every dog's a little bit different. What they respond to is a little bit different. If I have a dog that's not very motivated to eat or to play, right, very low motivation, and there are dogs like this, you know, like your Mollusers, your Kangals, stuff like this, then for sure you must use more negative in the training. And if you have a dog who's very sensitive, but also very motivated to work, your Border Collies, you know, a lot of the Belgian Malwas these days, for sure you're way more positive and your negative is very minimal. But they must both be there to some degree if you want reliability. 
And I don't care what anybody says, you know, the only thing is when a lot of people make the mistake of assuming. So they'll see a trainer and they train with a flat collar and a leash. They have like a sensitive, highly motivated dog. The dog loves to work for food and the dog is very motivated, loves to be working with the handler, is very biddable. We call these dogs biddable because they have a high natural intrinsic desire to work with the handler. Not all dogs are like this, believe me, right? There are dogs that really exhibit this to an extreme level, and there are dogs that exhibit this to like next to no level. And if you train enough dogs, you'll run into examples of both. So we have that dog that's highly motivated to work with the handler, that's very sensitive to the handler, and very motivated to take the food and the toys and so on and so forth. And this dog, if he's making a mistake, all you have to do is say, ah, ah, he will immediately stop what he's doing and fix it, or give him maybe just pull on the leash a little bit, and he'll be like, oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna be better, I'm gonna do it better, I'm gonna fix it, I'm gonna be a good boy. And that trainer will say, well, I'm positive only, I don't use tools, I don't need tools, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you don't need tools for that dog, but you're still using negative. That ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, that no, that pull on the leash, all of these things, even just changing your body posture with that dog, <gasps> right? That's pressure. You are using it, whether you admit it or not. Now, the vast majority of dogs fall in between both those extremes, because you'll have a dog, he, you can yell, no, stop. You can, you know, bang on him with the leash all day long. He's not gonna change his behavior. That dog needs a much more strong form of negative reinforcement. Both of these things together create reliability. That is my point. And that is the key. Anything you train, you layer both into the process because down the road, if your dog says no, or if your dog maybe is a little bit worried about doing something, you have both of these things now to pull on to reinforce the behavior that you taught. And I don't care what behavior you teach, whether it's healing, a sit, a down, a recall, whatever. There's this thing that we're going to call deterioration, where you see the behavior deteriorate if it is not correctly being reinforced. Any behavior without reinforcement will begin to deteriorate. You have to always be cognizant of that. And that's why when you layer these things into your training, you're always able to maintain and tune up your dog's repertoire of behaviors and training, so on and so forth. So guys, this is my lecture on reinforcement. I hope it makes sense. Now, one more thing, guys. When you make pressure on both sides, right? Under pressure, diamonds are formed. It is your job to create not only behaviors that are productive and functional in your dog for whatever it is that you're doing with your dog. It is also your job to create resiliency within those behaviors. And resiliency means that your dog is able to overcome obstacles to the behavior. And that could be anything like a competing motivator. It could be your dog being a little afraid. It could be your dog being overly aroused. Whatever it is that's impeding your dog's ability to perform that behavior, he needs to be resilient in that behavior. He needs to be resilient mentally and resilient physically. Just as you should be raising your children to not be fragile little snowflakes. You should be raising them to be resilient mentally and physically, able to overcome adversity, able to shrug it off, move forward and be productive. It's the same when we train dogs. That comes through with the positive and the negative, just as all things in life. Guys, I'm gonna finish on this. Thank you for watching. I'm putting this content out for free on YouTube. Imagine what you can get on my online courses, shieldk9online.com. You'll see the link in the banner below and in the description below. And on my Patreon, I'm putting out real, unedited, raw training footage of me training various dogs to do various different things, whether it's behavior training, obedience training, sport training, so on and so forth. You can see it all on my Patreon or on my online courses. Check it out. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, comment below.